So I would like to say welcome um, to everybody who has joined us for uh, today's seminar. This is uh, another seminar uh, in the series that uh, we are running uh, jointly um, with um, Culture in Perth and King Ross and Institute for Northern Studies, Highlands and Islands, um, who are you know, based uh, in, in Perth. And uh, we are very happy to see so many people here. I think we have a very international audience. Um, and um, today's speaker is uh, Dr. Louisa Campbell from the University of Glasgow, where she is a research fellow. And we've asked Louisa to come and speak to us today because of her interesting work um, on, on material culture and um, particularly Roman material culture, which is the current uh, theme of this part of, of the series, um, and her sort of non-invasive methods of, of studying uh, material culture. So I'm going to uh, give the word to Louisa in a second, um, and she's going to share her screen and show her PowerPoint. Um, and if you have any questions that you'd like to ask, please put them in the chat. And when Louise is finished, um, I will uh, read out the, the questions or some of them, depending on how much time we've got. Um, and Louisa will do her very best to answer them. So um, please go ahead, Louisa. We're looking forward to hearing your talk. Fantastic. Thanks, Alex. And thanks everyone for inviting me today. I'm really looking forward to sort of, uh, talking about some of my research with you. I'm just going to share my screen if I can. And that's nothing to do with you guys. <laughs> right, okay. So, um, as I say, I'm really pleased to be joining you today. Um, I'm going to be discussing my work analysing polychromy, which is the terminology, the terminology that we use for, uh, co for colouring in um, on classical sculptures. Um, I'm identifying this in a sort of a, a new trend, if you like, a new terminology of cultural chemistry. Um, and I'm looking at this, uh, through non-destructive analysis techniques. Um, if there's time at the end, I'd quite like to explore some of the other work that I'm actually engaged with that you might find of interest as well, but we'll see how our timing goes anyway. Um, but I'm really pleased to be able to come and talk to you about these really quite extraordinary monuments. And I'm working between two computers just now, so <laughs> forgive me if things go a bit awry, uh, but I, I hopefully will be okay. So um, I think I'd probably quite like to start with this quote um, from Jones and McGregor. I'm not going to read it out to you. I'll let you have a, a read at it yourself. But I think it really nicely captured, encapsulates um, the significance that colour holds for us um, and how colour permeates really every aspect of our lived experience. And often what we find is archaeologists and museums barely recognise or acknowledge the presence of colour in the objects that we're working with. And I think it's really important that we um, that we do, you know, make reference to that. So this is where I'm coming from today, um, because I think colour is really a very integral, integral, oh, integral uh, element of our engagement with the world around us. And that's something that I'm motivated personally to change. And so colour plays a really pivotal role in our modern perception of and our engagement with the world around us. And we can experience that in our everyday lives. Um, and that's in our landscapes and in our seascapes. And the rich vibrancy of the clothes that we're wearing. And even in the body art that we're adorning ourselves with. And the objects that we uh, use on our daily basis. Or on the jewellery that we're wearing and adorning ourselves with. So there seems to be a timer on my slide, so I, if, I might have to jump back and forth with that. So I'm sorry about that. Um, but it's also really prevalent on the imagery that we're exposed to through some of the magnificent works of arts that we, we, we encounter in our lives. And, and that can even be through our television screens or through digital technologies, for example. And so my point is we don't live our, cell, our whole lives in monochrome, okay? We're immersed in colour as a sensory experience and, Really, we subconsciously expect to see colour wherever we look. And colour has the power to transform the things to which it's applied, and it carries with it this intrinsic symbolic significance uh, and ways of being that really transcend the, the purely visual because it connects to our other senses. Um, and that 
And by that, I mean, it connects to things like sound, um, smell uh, and touch, for example. And it can elicit an emotional response um, to representations of people and deities or actions and things. And we actually expect to see certain colours um, applied to certain objects or images. Uh, and we're very fortunate that we have information surviving from Roman writers, so including Vitruvius, um, he was writing in the first century um, before BCE, and Pliny the Elder, who was writing in the first century. Um, and they were talking about sources, preparation of uh, pigments and the application of them as well. I'm sorry, my computer seems to be jumping. I do apologise for that. Um, I've, I've put a point there in about Pliny, you know, what Pliny does is he actually categorises some of his colours into two different uh, strands. So he talks about um, the more expensive and exotic pigments as being florid, and those are, um, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, and, and he also talks about um, more commonly available pigments as being austere. So these are just the categories that he talks about. And some of these uh, florid pigments are really quite challenging to get to. So you have to be pretty rich and have access to, you know, good resources in order to get even get a hold of them to use. Um, and I've just put up an image there of some of the uh, little beautifully preserved, if, if tragically preserved, pots of pigments that have been recovered um, from Pompeii. Yeah, after the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. And so, um, here's a wider perspective of that um, fresco that I showed you a moment ago. And, and it's just to show you that actually, you know, how significant and important colour was in the lives of the Romans. So they're no different to us today insofar as they lived their lives in full colour. Um, this frieze on the left is a really a beautifully, uh, again from Pompeii, beautifully preserved frieze that runs right across the, the walls of the room from the um, uh, Villa of Mysteries in Pompeii. And it's a dynastic frieze basically. And what that does is it's thought to represent the secret cult of, um, of womanhood. So it's young women, we believe moving into adulthood and it's it's really again beautifully if tragically preserved but it's just to demonstrate just how critical colour is um, or was to the Romans in, in much the same way as it is to us today. And on the right is just to show you another example of um, Roman traditions and colour uh, again manifest in this wonderfully preserved mosaic from um, which is really typical to the period uh, that's the second century piece, so a wee bit beyond Pompeii. Uh, you might even recognise these uh, statues. Uh, these are life-size statues that once graced the Parthenon um, in the Athenian Parthenon. Um, they're now on display in the British Museum. You might know them better as the Elgin Marbles. Um, on the surface, they appear to follow a really similar pattern of quite marble statues, and they're really frozen, if you like, in time. Um, in various poses, okay? But actually, if we look really closely, we can see that in fact, these magnificently uh, articulated sculptures uh, were once adorned in vibrant pigments. So they were brought to life in full vibrant polychrome color. And the only residue that we have on them now is surviving in really deep, quite well hidden crevices. Um, and that's because uh, when they were first put on display in the museum, they were um, they were cleaned up by the museum staff who were, you know, acting in good faith and trying to make these things beautiful for a viewing public. But in fact, what they did was they, um, they, they, they scrubbed off any surface residue of the, of the colour. But as I say, if we look very, very closely in these hidden crevices, um, we might actually be able to uh, find some of these pigments still surviving. And I think if we start to reimagine how those vibrant colours would have brought fluidity and movement to this scene, uh, we can start to imagine how people would have been depicting their, you know, their peers, other people in their community potentially that they knew. Um, and I think it gives it, the scene a much more realistic feel to it um, that's missing from that pristine white, if you like, cleaned version. Um, and I think being painted again in colours would have really brought these magnificent objects to life. 
Uh, and I think it would also have drawn real, real connections between and relationships between the people who were engaging with these statues. So thinking about classical sculpture, we can see that actually, um, as Marlow tells us, um, Athens was never white, but, but her statues bereft of colour have conditioned the artistic sensibilities of Europe. The whole past has re reached us colourless. Um, and I think that's epitomised really in this lovely little cartoon um, because it represents our, our flawed interpretation of how statues and buildings would have looked in the past. And this representation, uh, representation um, depicts objects and architecture in full authentic colour. Um, but as the last quote tells us, we've been accustomed to applying an, if you like, an antiquity filter to those colours so that we now expect to see everything in monochrome. And that's really not the way it was at all, uh, which I hope to, to demonstrate to you today. But I want to also sort of draw your attention to this. I'll just pull these, uh, our faces down there. Um, this is quite a, a potentially quite controversial aspect to the topic that Professor Nell Painter, um, she's an emerita professor from uh, Princeton University. And she really eloquently summarizes how that kind of underlying, um, if you like, um, colonial attitude towards colour on painting actually is. And she tells us, I think she cuts to the very heart of um, colonialism here and post-colonial when she talks about this concept of, um, you know, I, an ideal being pristine, white, pure, uh, and devoid of any colour. So if you like, what she's saying is white equals purity, prestigiousness, cleanliness, and perfection. Okay, so that's just an underlying thing that we need to th think about in our recent past, how we've um, been exposed to these types of uh, sculptures as well. It's an underlying thing that, you know, often people will say to me, oh, I don't like to think about colour on them. I like to think of them as white, but, you know, should, we should sort of challenge ourselves, I think, a little bit in that, in that sense. Uh, so, um, as with uh, these earlier Greek sculptures, actually Roman sculptures were not intended to be these static, sterile, white marble objects either. And we've got lots of examples of them being painted in these vibrant colours and that brought them to life. And again, I think we can see that these really creative connections and relationships between people and these statues. I just love these uh, images here. Um, on the left, we have a, um, a, a, you know, a head of Aphrodite and what looks like mascara running down her face is in fact, um, is in fact the residue of metal uh, bronze eyelashes that were inserted into her uh, eyelids. Um, unlike the Amazonian warrior in the middle who had her eyelashes painted in. But it gives us a flavour of how these things may have looked in the past. And we also have representations of polychrome on statues, okay? So we have these wonderful examples of, um, of frescoes with painted statues in lifelike colours on, on the walls of different, um, of different villas and um, you know, places throughout the empire. On the right is, a, is actually a, a really small intaglio, which is an insert into a signet ring. And it shows a Greek artist who is painting uh, a Roman head. Okay, so the bust of a Roman woman. So I think that tells us a, a really interesting story. Other examples, these are from Pompeii. Um, they tell us that we are, the people at the time were accustomed to seeing painted statues, okay? How do we know these are paintings of statues? Because this is Artemis and her brother, um, and actually they're standing on plinths, okay? So that's the same with the ones I showed you a moment ago. They're standing on plinths, so that gives us a very clear indication that these were actually paintings of painted statues. Who is painting them? Well, this is an interesting insight into it. We have, again, from Pompeii, this fascinating insight into an artist who is painting these statues. Here we have a female um, artist. She's being watched as she practices her craft by two women in the background. Um, and it's thought that the artist is actually painting um, a picture that's on the floor being held by Cupid. Okay, but I I would argue that actually, no, I don't believe that's the case. I think, in fact, she's more likely to be painting the statue in front of her. Uh, and actually what she has on the floor is a handy portable template image that actually ensures she's applying the correct colours and the correct, uh, you know, prescribed colours, if you like, and um, from a recognisable palette of colours uh, into appropriate places. 
okay So this is just to demonstrate to you some of the um, relief sculptures that we have evidence from uh, different parts of the empire which have been painted. These are white marble um, relief sculptures from Nicomedia in northern Turkey. And this is uh, the goddess Roma, she has a small Nike in her hands and she is in a procession with Togate Roman citizens. And you can just about make out, I think, the quite beautifully depicted yellows, golden yellows on the bottom of her dress, on her uh, spear and on Nike that she's holding uh, and, and the, the reds on the togas of the, the other people in the procession. And here is even better um, residue of colour in the form of the cloaks of these two emperors who are, who are greeting each other, Diocletian and Maximian. And even on the uh, on the chariot behind them, you can see the the reds and and the sort of yellow browns of the of the wheel uh, of their of their chariot. So again, just to demonstrate to you that this is something that we we are not accustomed to, but I think we can say that quite clearly, a Roman audiences uh, would have been accustomed to. Okay, so just to, to also think, because we're going to talk today about some inscriptions um, and we have quite good evidence again for there being a, a practice of colouring in the letters on inscribed texts. So this is, uh, it's not from Britain, um, this is an inscription for Hadrian and it was recovered from Egypt, it's now in the British Museum. But I think we can actually depict quite nicely here uh, very clearly there are residues of red pigments in the letterings here and that's really important. You might go to some museums and you may see some, um, some altars, uh, Roman inscriptions that have red on. If it's a really red, vibrant red, it could be that that's a more recent application of red depicting these colours, but actually it's probably been applied more recently because um, the museums who are caring for them or whoever had them before that originally depicted the fact that they had red in the lettering, uh, as we can see here. So, just returning to the focus of our talk today, I think it's probably quite useful to consider the Antonine Wall. Um, and this is Rome's most northwesterly frontier, and it's part of the UNESCO World Heritage frontiers of the Roman Empire um, heritage site, World Heritage Site. So it's a really important part of a, a far reaching Roman frontier. And we're right up there at the very top. We, uh, our Antony Wall is the most north northwesterly frontier of that empire. Uh, the wall is uh, unlike Hadrian's Wall, which is a, a stone based wall, as most of you will probably already know. The Antonine Wall is a turf rampart. It sits on top of a stone base. Um, it reaches probably about three metres high. Um, it has a five metre deep ditch in front of it as part of the defence system. Um, and this wall cleaved a route um, through the, um, right across the Clyde Port Isthmus. And it separated very neatly the uh, Roman controlled south part of the area to the non-Roman controlled part on the top. Uh, we know the wall was constructed around AD 142 and it was commissioned by the emperor of the day, that was Antoninus Pius. And we know too that it was built by the Roman legions um, and those were specifically the 2nd, the 6th and the 20th legions. Again, how do we know that? Well, we know it's because of the Antonine wall distance sculptures. Um, so, what the legions did was they recorded uh, in the texts that are inscribed onto our distance sculptures um, and into the relief sculptures that are there, um, they, they recorded um, the legions who were constructing the frontier. Okay. Now, they are all the texts of these distance sculptures are following a really prescriptive, uh, formulaic, abbreviated type of Latin, and that's very common practice for the day in epigraphy, which is just a word that we use for inscriptions, okay? Um, and that's really so that they could fit as much information as they possibly could into a small um, So, um, I just want to uh, give me an example here from the Somerston, Somerston Farm. 
um, does some sculpture, which is now in the Ontario Museum. And just to let you see the type of text um, that is applied to these, it's a pretty formulaic content as well as how it is written, okay? So uh, I won't go into the Latin aspect of it because it is very shortened, but if it, effectively what it um, translates to is, this is for the Emperor Caesar, Titus, Aelius, Hadrianus, Antoninus, Augustus, Pius, which is to give him his full title, um, father of his country, the second Augustan legion built this of 3,666 and a half units of measure. Okay, so it's really important that they've got all these half measures in there as well. They're, you know, everything that the Romans do is pretty precise. Okay, so um, it's very important that they put that half unit of measure in there as well. Um, Many of them have iconography on it, as we see here. Um, on the left, we have a, a scene of um, a Roman cameraman who's riding down um, some northern warriors that he's captured. They are quite typically depicted as naked. Now, they probably weren't naked. This is a propaganda statement from Rome where Romans are uh, depicted as being the kind of, uh, you know, able to subjugate um, barbarian peoples. Um, the Roman cavalryman is being honoured by the goddess Victory, um, who is placing a wreath on him. And on the right, we have um, we have the, uh, the the Roman eagle that most of us are probably familiar with, and he is sitting atop of the the Second Legion's uh, emblem. And there is a, another captured Northern warrior below him. Okay. Not all of the distance sculptures have that kind of iconography on them, but the couple that we're going to focus on today do have. So just very briefly, some context into who, why, what, where, when, which is the kind of common questions that we as archaeologists are always asking. What are these things? Well, they are a record of the distances that were built of the frontier by the legions who were constructing the wall. Um, they are also a, a really nice and unique source of information uh, through the iconography that is um, sculpted upon them. Where they were mounted at accessible points and places on the frontier, uh, I've got a little bit more on that later. Uh, when, I mentioned before, from around 142 AD. Um, who? Well, there are actually multiple who's associated with this. We could think about who was crafting them. There were craftsmen in the Roman army, so they were probably um, soldiers who were also stonemasons. Um, who commissioned them? Possibly those same sculptors, or more likely the le people within the legions themselves who wanted to, um, you know, show their allegiance to the empire, but also to promote all the work that they are doing on the empire, and probably a little bit of competition between the um, the legions as well, which is possibly why they're so specific about their numbers uh, or, or distance of the frontier they're building as well. Who is being commemorated? Those legions who has been dedicated to the Emperor Antoninus Pius. Who's depicted upon them? Well, the legions, cabaretmen, deities, Roman deities, uh, religious practice has been uh, depicted upon them, and also the Roman, uh, the non-Roman peoples that the legions were coming into contact. Um, and, and, and many, many more who's are woven through these objects as well. Uh, why? That again, there's multiple whys associated with these objects. As I say, they're, they're effectively very propagandist objects. They are a means through which Rome can very effectively and very quickly um, put forward a message to anyone looking at them that um, she has subjugated this region and the legions are there working on Rome's behalf to subjugate and to keep control of the region. Um, it's actually a way of Rome, you know, we, we know about propaganda, that the Roman writers in the past were using propagandist terminologies and propagandist writing to, you know, to the glory of Rome. But actually, I think I would suggest that these, uh, the iconography and the texts on these uh, distance sculptures serve the same purpose. It just does it much more quickly and much more graphically. Okay, so if you're a Roman, for example, you can access all aspects of the sculpture, you understand the iconography, and you can potentially read the text. Um, and if you don't read everything in Latin, the formulaic way, 
that the Latin is presented to you will probably be familiar to you on some level. Um, if you're a local Iron Age person, you won't you won't probably be able to access the um, either the text or some of the iconography. But it's quite likely you would certainly be able to depict your own representation of you and your people being subjugated uh, by a, a powerful Roman incoming force. They're also a way of really um, of the legions aligning themselves with the, the emperor and commemorating themselves and and him. Um, they're also mon they're monuments in their own right. So the, the Antonine Frontier is a monument, um, but actually these objects are also monuments as well, I would suggest. So they're, they're tying into an existing monument. And as I said, they're probably a little bit of competition between the legions as well, you know, showing off to each other who did as much more work than others, okay? Right, so... Um, the primary aims of uh, the work that I've been undertaking on these objects, as Alex mentioned briefly in the beginning there, is to determine whether our Antonine wall distance sculptures were originally painted and if so, uh, what were they painted with? Okay, so I want to reconstruct how these things might have looked uh, with the, the paints that were once applied to them. Now, in order to protect the integrity of these objects, which is obviously absolutely critical because you can't replace them and we don't want to damage them in any way. We want our um, curatorial staff to be confident that we're not going to harm them in any way and that we're respectful of them. So I've been using non-destructive analysis on these uh, objects and it's been really informative. So one of the, one of the techniques I've been using is PXRF, which is uh, portable X-ray fluorescence. And that really emits X-rays um, to help us measure chemical compositions. And these um, atoms emit fluorescent X-rays, energies um, that we know about the elemental composition. Okay, so we can match, we can essentially match the elements that are present in a sample that we're taking. Um, but that doesn't go quite far enough and it doesn't give us a full, full picture, if you like, on what these pigments were. So, in order to understand it more better and to fingerprint it more, more the pigment more effectively, I've coupled the uh, portable X-ray fluorescence with portable Raman spectroscopy. And that is effectively a means of measuring the minerals. So the X-ray fluorescence gives us the elements and the Raman spectroscopy provides us with minerals. Okay, and that works without going into detail. It works through shining a laser at a sample and um, that scatters some lights, uh, some light um, across the sample. And when the settles, we have a rally scatter, which actually changes the wavelength of the, uh, of the, of the light. And it gives us a very good, clear fingerprint of the minerals present. So both of these techniques together give us a really interesting uh, and full uh, identification of what's present in the sample. Uh, and I also, just for your information, I used two portable X-ray fluorescents just to see how each of them um, measured the different um, information available. Okay, so that was a really useful exercise to, uh, to make sure that the, the data was robust. Um, again, just some images of me, of me using the Raman spectrometer uh, in Edinburgh for the, uh, one, of the, one of the distance sculptures that we'll be seeing in a moment. Okay, I'm not going to go into all of the details because um, it's not necessary <laughs> and I'm sure you, would, uh, you wouldn't thank me for it. But it's just to give you an idea of the kind of information that was brought forward through the results. And we can see, for example, that we have high readings of um, iron depicting different types of pigments, earth-based um, iron oxide, um, pigments in certain areas and we have uh, for example other types of elevated elements and minerals telling us that there's a different kind of colour in other parts of the sculpture so um, for example we have bright red on um, fallen captive spaces and on their uh, chests for example and I'll show you in a moment another, um, the, yeah, here we are. We've got the full spectrum here of, of, of what actually was shown up through the results of our uh, analysis here. Uh, one of my colleagues, <laughs> colleagues has called this a 50 shades of red, and I, I quite like that <laughs> because what, what our analysis tells us is, is in fact, 
We have a palette here of colours applied to our distance wall sculpt, uh, antenna wall distance sculptures um, that's dominated by reds. Okay, we also have a couple of yellows and whites as well, but the majority of our colours are red based. And I don't think that should be a great surprise to us because actually red dominates the palettes of most um, indigenous populations, if you like. Um, you know, most places can find uh, easy access to reds and and yellows as well. Okay, so um, ethnographic analogy, for example, tells us that's a very common practice. And we shouldn't also be surprised that there are several different types of reds um, in our sculptures because actually, as I mentioned at the start, different red depicts a different type of, um, you know, uh, I um, object that we're looking at. Okay, so we have minium red, which is red lead, and we have evidence of that on the on the chest, head, beard, thigh, and cheek of captives on the Somerson stone that I showed you a moment ago. Um, the bridge nest stone, which I'll show you in a moment, actually shows us um, a minium red as well um, on the neck and the decapitated head of a warrior, and on a shield and on the top frame of part of the architecture on the piece. So actually, um, red lead is very commonly used, because it's so bright, it's quite commonly used to depict the blood. And we shouldn't be surprised at that. It also, sh it's also showing up on the beard of, uh, on the beak, I believe, uh, of the um, eagle on the Somerset farm, which I'm suggesting actually is a representation of Rome's eagle feasting off the blood of her enemies. Different kind of red we're seeing on the cloak of the riders, um, another kind of red on the letters, a madder red, which is a natural um, dye, um, and another kind of red, real gar, in some of the letters as well. So there's some evidence of mixing of reds as well to get a more vibrant colour of red. I mentioned to you earlier about red being in the lettering of some of, of the Roman inscriptions that we're aware of. Um, my work in the north of England shows that that red is usually vermilion. Now, we don't have any evidence so far of that in our, our Scottish context, but it could well be that this mixing of Mara red and Rilgar was, you know, put together so that it would emulate that different type of vibrant red. Okay. And again, we have some evidence of um, whites and yellows, and you'll remember that um, frieze that I showed you, the uh, relief sculpture of Roma carrying Nike along in, a, um, in that beautiful um, white marble frieze. Um, so it's not surprising that we have yellow on the dress of victory there as well. Okay. So a restricted palette and a prescriptive application. Okay, so we again expect to see particular strands of these colours in, in specific contexts. So what I've had to do is try and find ways of articulating that and I've been doing a little bit of experimental work so that we can authentically reproduce these colours. Okay, so there have been some um, representations of polychromia in these ancient artworks, but in fact some of them are not particularly um, authentic, they're not realistic, um, because as I say, red isn't just red, we have to be careful uh, with their tonal approach in the same way as an artist today. Artists in Rome would have been very careful of um, getting the, the correct tones in place. So I've been doing some experimental work, getting some original types of pigments and applying them onto sandstone, because all of our um, Antonine wall distance sculptures are sandstone, which is not the easiest <laughs> stone to work with, to be honest, uh, using the techniques that we're using. So I mentioned that actually um, some work has been done on ancient sculptures in this regard. And here we have a life-size sculpture of the Emperor Augustus. If we look really closely, we can see that his curious, that's his uh, chest plate, is decorated in relief with various propaganda scenes. And that's depicting um, his victory in battle in the Parthian War. Again, as a common theme through Roman art is the subjugation of provincial peoples. Uh, you can't see it very well, but actually on his shoulders, there's representation of uh, sphinxes um, representing his defeat of Cleopatra. Now, if we think about these things with colour, which they were originally found with, this is a plaster cast replica of that Prima, Cor Prima Porta Augustus. We can see 
a whole different um, a whole different dimension to the piece, and it really does bring to life um, how that statue would have looked when it was originally painted uh, in the first century. Um, I think actually it's slightly brighter than it would have been, but I think it's a very nice representation of how it would have looked. This is a similar reconstruction of um, a head of Caligula, that was from Copenhagen. That also originally had some traces of original colochrome, the original pigment. Um, close analysis of this has confirmed that different shades of ochre, for example, and other pigments were applied to it in layers, um, so that the sculpture really had a lifelike representation of the emperor. Uh, and that on the left is just a, a, a really, it's a, a, again, another plaster reconstruction to uh, give you an idea of how those uh, colours would have looked in, in the first century. So just to show you that actually this work really helps us to give a new dimension to these ancient statues. Um, here again, we have a spectacular reconstruction of a scene commonly found in the cult space of uh, Mithraeum, uh, which is depicting the god Mithra um, participating in a sacrificial uh, ceremony that's um, killing a bull. Okay, there's some really common elements to this. And this is, as I say, a, a reconstruction. And that is based actually on what we know from things like this beautiful um, reconstruction. Uh, this is a, a, an authentic um, fresco, which really gives us a, 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 you know, a clear understanding that, that that, I'll just show you again, that reconstruction is pretty accurate. Okay. Um, and here in relief again is another representation of that scene um, sculpted into marble and the colours here have preserved really, really well. And it's even to the fact that we can see gold on the god uh, God's face and in his cuffs, his hands and the dagger that he's holding. And that's really just a shout out to, to represent his cult status. But actually digital reconstructions have been really useful as well because what they've been able to do is really bring to life these, again, quite static scenes. This is a scene from the Altar of Peace, the Arapakis from Rome. And again, it gives us a real understanding of how that wonderful uh, piece of art would have looked. And it really brings it to life as more of a fluid scene rather than the, the snapshot that the black and white gives us. I'm showing, why am I showing you all this? Just to give you an idea of how ours would have looked. And this is the, um, the scene. I don't know why this little blue line has showed up <laughs> in my, uh, <laughs> it showed up a couple of slides ago and I'm not sure what happened, but anyway. <laughs> um, that's not there in my original, <laughs> my original uh, reconstruction here. So just try to ignore the blue line. Um, and this is a representation, a digital representation of a scene uh, from that stone from Bridge Nest that I mentioned earlier. Um, now, you'll see the similar types of pattern in the iconography here, as you saw on Somerston Farm. This time, though, we have a scene of battle. This is in the midst of battle, whereas the previous scene that I showed you was a post-battle scene where people had been captured and they were being guarded over by a Roman cavalryman. This now is a really brutal scene of battle where the cavalryman is riding them down. He's spearing them. You can see the blood on the end of his spear. Um, and he's scattering them below them. And, and I mentioned about the decapitated head of one of the um, of, of one of those protagonists, the northern um, warrior there. And just to show you that, I hope you have a strong stomach. And that's just to see it in a little bit more detail. And, I think that draws out really nicely what I mentioned earlier regarding the different tones of red and how important that is to really give an authentic flavour of how these things would have looked. Okay, so the red that the rider is wearing on his cloak is a kind of browny, earthy, deep red from ochres that were being applied. Um, whereas the red on the decapitated head and on the neck of the fallen warrior at the bottom is that minium red that I mentioned, that blood red, okay? So it's important to, to be able to depict these different elements in a scene because if we, if we don't go with these tonal effects, then it's not going to have the same impact. And we should remember that when we're engaging with these things. 
So some observations that I've um, I've come to through having um, undertaken this work is it really is quite innovative work and it hasn't previously been attempted and now I know why <laughs> because working with sandstone is quite challenging using these non-destructive technologies. Um, it's easier in marble which doesn't have as many inclusions so sandstone has a lot of uh, natural elements and minerals uh, there already which um, it's, you know you really have to try to mitigate by uh, when we're using these techniques. Um, but anyway, um, I think it's, it's innovative because no one else is doing this. Anyone else who's looked at these types of um, techniques on sculpture, it has been on marble. So this has been really innovative work. Um, and it does demonstrate that, in fact, these techniques, they do work. And although there are challenges applied to them and associated with them, they do work, which is really, um, you know, really helpful. We've, we've established a palette of colours and it is dominated by reds and yellows. Uh, and we've established that there is this prescriptive use of colour, so this expectation of specific colours in specific contexts. Um, and we also know that, you know, I mentioned that madder was there and ochres. So these are probably locally acquired. So these are not, um, you know, I mentioned I was doing some work in the North England examples and um, Certainly the colours, uh, some of the colours that were being applied there were not local. They would be in that florid, if you like, palette that I mentioned uh, from Pliny earlier. So they're not locally produced. They would have been more difficult to produce and they would have had to be acquired from other parts of the empire. Here, yes, some um, of those far reaching ones would, were present, but also some locally produced ones or locally sourced ones, should I say. But what it has also done, the work has um, highlighted that we really need to reevaluate our conservation practices. Um, we need to think about preserving the surface of these objects because we never really know what techniques are going to become available to us in the future. So it's really important that we maintain the integrity of these things and we um, try not to clean off uh, surface treatments that, in fact, even though at this moment in time we may not be able to understand or identify or even see with the naked eye. Um, techniques are always emerging that may allow us to do that. So we should be very careful going forward in, in how we approach these things. So uh, I just thought, I think uh, we've got a little bit of time. If it's okay with Alex, I'll just sort of quickly bash on with a couple of my other points. Is that okay, Alex? Yeah, definitely, go on. So they, these are all of the distance sculptures, uh, this and the next page, in all of their glory. And inevitably, when you're working with these types of things, when you're working with material culture, you start to unpeel unforeseen and unanticipated layers in your research and actually often takes you in completely unanticipated directions. So the Antonine wall sculptures, um, these layers are really rich and uh, they've been exciting for me to unfold and uh, they're actually quite controversial. So I'm not going to go into too much depth in them um, because that's a whole other talk, but I can take you on a really brief aerial survey on some of the, some of the other things that have been thrown up to me uh, through the research. And um, that's just another few of the stones there. So one of the things that's come up actually is that um, Context of discovery, I've looked very closely at actually where these things uh, have been recovered from and actually contrary to traditional opinion, none of these monuments were found in um, on the wall or north of the wall, they were all found to the south of the wall um, and that's really important, although some of their find spots have erroneously been recorded in both official platforms and historical texts, it's really important that we understand that these are all to the south of the wall. Um, what I have here with the blue squares is, is actually mapping where they were. It's quite difficult to see that in detail because it's clearly you know, showing you a really wide um, geographical context for these things, but they are all to the south of the wall. Uh, but that has also depunked a really long-standing proposal that these were all subject to deliberate uh, or ritual deposition. There's no evidence for that, in fact, when you look at the evidence. Um, it's also been historically suggested that were um, there were two sets of um, two sets of measurements on these objects. Um, so the, the suggestion is that the ones to the east have uh, MP 
okay, um, engraved, uh, inscribed upon them, and the ones to the west have P or PP, um, which um, the former is MP is thought to be for milia passum for paces, and the 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 P or PP is for pedes or feet. But in fact, this hypothesis doesn't really bear, uh, bear scrutiny because actually MP is for milia passum, which in fact equates to 1,000 paces, which equates to one mile. And we can't reasonably um, expect to suggest that, for example, the inscription on the bridge nest stone, which says 4,652, we can't reasonably expect that to, to uh, be interpreted as 4,652 miles. So there's a discrepancy there that I've, I've been working through. There's also some divergent distances um, in that some of these objects on the east, this is a really widely used schematic of the distance sculptures. And it's used to show that, you know, that they're more widely spaced, their, their recovery is more widely spaced in the east. And that's to support that hypothesis of um, a wider, a longer distances being recorded on the eastern based ones. But in fact, if we look really closely, we'll see that um, actually all of the ones on this map on the right, apart from one at the end of the wall, all have question marks. So these are not, in fact, um, distance sculptures, if you look carefully, they are projected where these distance sculptures may have occurred. In fact, they're not, they're not present. If you look again at my map, we can see that, um, in fact, we can draw a pretty clear line almost in the center of the, of, the, of the wall. And we can see that, in fact, only one, uh, which is a broken relief sculpture, uh, we can't definitively say is it a relief sculpture because it doesn't have any, um, it doesn't have the inscription uh, extant on it. Okay, um, there's another one that is in fact lost now and it's thought not to be a distance sculpture. It could actually be a pillar distance marker. Um, it has been lost, as I say, so that cannot be confirmed. Um, number two there is actually, was found completely out of context. It was built into the walls of Dunota Castle off the northeast coast of Scotland. So none of those objects uh, that I've highlighted there were actually um, in place. And if we look at it, in fact, from the centre of the wall, from Kirk and Tillich, which we can hardly call the east of the wall, in fact, there's only one object. One of these distance sculptures have been found to the east. So it's quite difficult to marry up that uh, some, some of the previous um, hypotheses regarding this. Um, I won't go into more detail here, but actually one of the other things that I thought uh, I wanted to sort of draw your attention to is this is really controversial. Um, for three centuries, it's been considered that these objects were embedded onto the wall or onto frames on the wall. But in fact, I'm going to suggest that potentially they are more likely to have been placed along the military way, which ran to the south of the wall in very much the same way as we expect to see road signs positioned today. Um, what be better way for a, an audience to actually be able to engage with them? So I think there's quite compelling evidence upon which I draw that conclusion, but time doesn't really permit us to go into that at all. I won't say too much more about it, other than I'm also looking at replication and flipping the scripts and colonial narratives. There's a few replicas that are um, used of the distant sculptures to help us engage with them. And some of my more recent work is sort of starting to think about how these are really quite colonial objects and they're used in a way that perpetuates old colonial narratives, okay? Um, but actually, it's not to dismiss them because replicas can be seen as extended objects of the originals. They've got their own biographies, they're really important things, and they are deserving of curation and accession in museums uh, on their own right. So I've been exploring that through the Rediscovering the Antonine Wall project, which is a fantastic project that I would encourage you to engage with if you have an interest. Um, and just tracking the, the, the trajectories of some of the replicas of that bridge and S sculpture that I spoke to you about, including a, a life-sized um, stone replica that's, in, that's been installed at Bone S near where the original was found digital 3D reconstructions and even a stamp that Royal Mail did as part of a, a recent um, special edition recently. 
and replicas are also being um, articulated through the students of City of Glasgow College, stonemasonry students who have done an amazing job in actually recreating some of these that will be installed uh, at specific locations along the wall for the local communities to engage with. Lastly, um, this is the final one, um, a, a new replica that has been articulated by local stonemasons. But in fact, this, this is the one that flips the scripts because it takes away, it, it effectively uh, flips the whole dynamic of the, um, of the iconography that was spoken about before. Here we have a scene on the left where we have a, an Iron Age protagonist on a chariot. He's running over a Roman um, soldier below him. And uh, on the right, we have a, a more settled scene of interaction and interplay between these local audiences, uh, sorry, local peoples and uh, Roman, um, Roman soldiers who are uh, engaging in trade with them. So thank you so much. I'm putting up this uh, archaeology festival poster from the University of Glasgow, which we're going to be doing in June, just in case anyone is interested in. But thank you so much. I, I've probably spoken for longer than I expected. Uh, and, and thank you for allowing me to come and, and speak to you today. I'm very happy to take any questions that uh, any of you may have. Well, thank you so much, Louisa. That was absolutely fascinating. I mean, we could have listened for another hour, I'm sure, without <laughs> any problems. <laughs> Um, yes, I mean, uh, I, have, I, I have, have so many questions that I could ask you. I think there's, there's one quite straightforward one that's in the chat that's been there for a while. Um, just asking what about the rectangles with the circles inside, uh, what they represent. I think you've seen some, what some of your stuff. Oh, yes. Um, look, so, yeah, that's a great question. Those are shields. Those are the, the shields of the fallen warriors. So they are rectangular shields with a, a, a circular boss in them. Thank you. Yeah, they, they seem to be quite common. I saw quite yes. a few of those. Yes, uh, they, they are. They're in both of the Bridge Nest and the Somerston and other representations. That scene of a Roman cavalryman riding down, um, you know, a North, an Indigenous warrior is quite common in frontier sculptures, actually. But yes, those, those are the shields. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you. Um, I, I was wondering, something that I was thinking about when I was listening um, to you was, um, the, the painting of these sculptures, do you know how long it would have lasted? Do they have to kind of retouch them and, and keep, keep them looking good? That's a really interesting question, actually, Alex. Um, it's not clear at the moment. I think they probably weren't uh, retouched very much, but I would suggest that it was common. That we have lots of evidence for Roman sculpture to be repainted. So I think in general terms, the, these sculptures would, would have had that intention, but the Antonine Wall was only actually occupied for 20 odd years, just over 20, 25 years. So it's, uh, it's unlikely they probably were, these ones were probably recolored, but the intent would have been there, I think, to do that. And one of the things, you know, I mentioned very briefly at the end about these replicas that were, were um, the Rediscovering the Antonine Wall project is engaging with. It's a really fantastic um, project that because it's bringing in old skills to young people today who are traditionally quite difficult to engage with in these things. But one of the things that I, I hope they might consider is to paint one of them. <laughs> and if they do, then that's a great way for us to track that. Let's see how um, the, the environmental conditions that we have here in Scotland impact the piece, um, you know, and see if they, if they need to be painted over a period of time. But that's a great question. I guess that might, it could be quite different from, you know, further south by the Mediterranean, for example. Absolutely. And I think that this is the, the Nike medium one that I showed you, you know, with the goddess uh, Roma and Nike and that procession of the Trogate Roman citizens. That has preserved really well because it was in Turkey. It's in warm conditions. It was in a covered conditions in a, in a sanctuary. So these, we have very, very harsh. This is one of the other reasons it's quite challenging to use these technologies because we have such harsh environmental conditions here and acidic soils so it's quite challenging to for these things just the, the pigments and surface treatments to survive so we're very fortunate they do survive um but they are very challenging to find so i'm, I'm pleased i managed to do it <laughs> yeah no it's, it's absolutely fantastic uh, so we've got some interesting questions uh coming up here in the chat. Do you have any thoughts on the lunette being similar in form to the shape found on Pictish stones is one of them. 
On the what, sorry, being, uh, sorry, I missed that first part. Lunette. Was that the, um, the, the curvature? I guess so. I think this is Michael Dempster. I don't know if you want to clarify your question, Michael, if you're still there. We can uh, we can come back to that one if you like. Um, so another question is where are the sculptures now? Uh, are any in the in the in the museum in Edinburgh? Yes, so um, almost all of the sculptures are in the Hunterian Museum at the University of Glasgow. Um, uh, there's only two that are not there. One of them is in the stores of the Glasgow Museums uh, in Kelvin Hall. The other one, which is the one that I've shown you with the reconstruction, the Bridge Nest sculpture is embedded into the wall of the National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh. So you can see that if you ever go, and I would encourage you to do that. It's a fantastic piece, it's huge, it's, it's massive. Uh, and the other thing with the replicas is there is a replica of that uh, as in a plaster cast of it in the Hunterian. So it helps to tell the story more holistically in the Hunterian, but the original is in Edinburgh uh, National Museum. Excellent. So well worth a visit. Absolutely. And the Hunterian has a fantastic display because it's their central exhibit. As you walk in the door, um, all of the sculptures are, are presented, um, you know, in a beautiful um, arc as you, as you walk in with all the other objects in as well. But it's, it's basically taking you on a journey from east to west or west to east, depending on what direction you take. But yeah, I would strongly encourage anyone to go to both. Fantastic. Um, another question here, could you explain why colouring uh, sculptures or statues were considered um, or, uh, unsophisticated? I think, I, I think that's a modern interpretation. I mentioned about Professor Painter, uh, which is a really interesting name really, isn't it? <laughs> um, her comment on that. And I think what, for me, what she's, what she's doing is she's cutting to the heart of that concept. That is a modern concept. It's a, it's quite a colonial, uh, 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 you know, mindset in thinking that anything that wasn't white, pristine, uh, you know, was unworthy. So they had, uh, this is a more recent historical uh, colonial um, mindset for in the last couple of hundred years, for example, where they were, that's why they were scrubbing down these beautiful uh, marbles from the Parthenon, because they didn't want to see those, you know, messy, scaly residues. They wanted that pristineness, and it's a, it's an underlying, almost a racist content. To be honest, I think uh, it's not, you know, explicit. It's just, it's, it's sort of an undertone, if you like. Um, yeah, how interesting. Lot, lots to unravel there. Uh, I'm sure. Um, right, so I think we have about uh, two more questions, um, at least. Um, are there any plans to look at other Roman sculpture in Scotland, for example, from fortresses? Yeah, Excellent. yeah, I'm actually, so I, my fellowship's running for the next few years, um, and I'm developing kit with my colleagues in, in Glasgow University um, in the physics department, so we're developing a suite of kits that will allow us to go out and actually look more carefully at uh, some of these objects. So yes, my plan, is, if it hadn't been interrupted by our recent, you know, situation, my plan was to go out and see uh, and do some analysis on these objects. And I, I plan to still do that. So yes, in the next year or two, I will be doing more analysis of, of different sculptures. Oh, you're on, you're on mute, Alex. Ah, thank you. <laughs> so we're very much looking forward to hear more about more about that. Um, so Michael then came back here uh, commenting on the, the curvature on some of the banners, etc., are similar in form to the V rod and crescent design on Pictish stones. Very interested in how the stones may have influenced domestic sculpture. Yeah, I thought that's what he was meaning. Is uh, they're 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 called pelta at the sides of some of the frameworks there. So they're they're they are very similar to. They're quite Celtic in their connection and their uh, their emulation. So yes, I would I would I would suggest there probably is a connection here because before the Roman uh, you know stone masons and sculptors were here, there wasn't a tradition of stone sculpture here in Scotland. So yes, I think there were many influences there, um, you know, and so yes, I wouldn't be surprised if some of those uh, influence and shape was part of that. 
And, and obviously, it doesn't mean that they took that on wholesale. There would be traditional practice already, but it, it certainly, I would say, influenced some of that um, in the pictures function. Right. Well, I think uh, I think those are the questions we've got time for. But I should also tell you uh, that there are there's a few there are a few more questions that I, I I can't read out today. But also, there's so many people who have said thank you for for such a fascinating talk and for bringing this this kind of dimension that's so unknown um, and to bring this to us today and just explaining. Well, you know, I think it gives us an idea of what life would have been like in Roman times, and it's so easy to to get that monochrome image that you gave us in the beginning. Um, so yes, absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. And we'll, I think we'll have to invite you back <laughs> and you can keep, you can uh, tell us more. More on the, on the more controversial aspects maybe that yeah. I touched on at the end. Somebody, I just quickly, somebody asked at the end about the Hadrian's Wall distance sculptures. I should say that actually there are no, um, the distance sculptures that we have are unique to Scotland. There's nothing quite like them in any other frontier. So yes, there are distance markers in Hadrian's Wall and there are inscriptions in other frontiers. Uh, and I have done work on those, which is really interesting work and I have published on it. Um, but the distance sculptures that we have, we should embrace because they really are unique. Um, you, you wouldn't find them anywhere else, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and maybe uh, the, if they go to your webpage, maybe they can see links to your, or at least um, some titles of your publications if they're interested. Absolutely. Yes, up. please do, then, because I've, I've published on this, so yes, please do have a look at that. Well, um, thank you so much, Louisa, for coming today, and thank you for, for everybody um, who's come uh, to listen and uh, have asked so many interesting questions. And uh, so this um, this talk is being recorded, and it will be available in due course um, through YouTube. So you can you can revisit again and, and listen mm -hmm. to it once more if you like. Listen That's to all my mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you so much for everyone for coming along. It's been an absolute pleasure, and thank you for inviting me to come and talk to you today.